Essie had led the three of them through the forest, looking for the elusive berry bush. It had only taken about five minutes of searching on the wing before they had found it. Covering ground was really a lot easier when on the wing, even if they had to duck and dive around the massive tree trunks. Saf had of course decided to try and have a little fun, flinging herself over branches and diving down between the smaller trees to run the slalom between them. Fengi had followed, the smaller, very nippy huntress managing the tight turns just fine. So Saf had put on a little more speed to see just how fast the diminutive Fengi could go down here. They were soon racing along, with Essie putting on some more speed too, keeping watch from above as the two of them had their fun. Before long, it became rather clear Fengi was trying to catch Saf. Tag it is then, I'll show you. Finding a small stretch of open air, Saf put her larger, stronger wings to use, accelerating away from a struggling Fengi. Down here, straight line speed wouldn't win her much though, nor was it much fun. So she locked her wings and banked a full 90 degrees, pulling into a sharp turn around a young Ashwood and savouring the familiar feeling as her wings bent like springs under the load, leaving her suspended on a rather smooth ride, hurtling around the sharp corner. Fengi could turn sharply, even sharper in fact, but she could not hold her speed in the turn as well. Her wings were smaller and she weighed less. Saf wouldn't much approve of anyone calling her a fat ass, but she had to concede that she was larger than Fengi. Glancing behind her, Fengi was indeed falling behind as Saf reversed her turn, rolling back over and pulling up hard once more, looking to bleed all the speed out of Fengi behind her. Fengi sadly wasn't stupid though, and didn't follow into said turn, instead pulling up and out with loose branches, folding up her wings and simply slamming through with a crash of snapping twigs and small branches. Well I guess that's one way to do it, Saf let out looking at the beam of light peeking through where Fengi had vacated the battlefield. So, where is she going? Seth pondered as she slowed down, gliding along while trying not to make noise. Soon enough, she spotted Fengi through a hole in the lower tree cover, the young huntress flying up under the cover of the heaven oak, clearly searching for prey. Worryingly, she had definitely seen Saf and began a dive down at speed. Ah, shit, Saf let out and she tried to pass speed back on again. A quick check behind her confirmed that wasn't happening before Fengi managed to dive on her back. So instead, she flared up to vertical, wings spread wide and tensing from nose to tail tip as she pulled a fair amount of G's, coming to a near stop in less than a second. Sure enough, Fengi came hurtling past with much swearing as she had to pull up to not smack into the ground. Surf beat her wings just enough to get enough speed to stay airborne, then watched what the young huntress would do next. Fengi elected to bleed her excess speed in a sharp right turn, whipping around with frightening ease. Saf carried on steadily, heading right at the much faster flying Fengi, trying to see if maybe she would be up for a game of chicken. From above, Essie shouted out for them to stop this nonsense as Fengi took the bait. Saf needed to make sure Fengi didn't just slap her with her tail or something as the two passed each other, as well as avoiding a collision of course. Luckily, a forest were full of trees, so with a quick bank, she pulled up and to the right, right up into a nice protective treetop where she deftly landed, claws digging into the soft bark. You bastard! Fengi shouted out, seemingly rather upset at her continued failure as Saf sniggered, watching the young huntress go by once more, having carried far too much speed. Saf had ended up in a rather precarious situation though, and it didn't take Fengi long to come around and come in for a landing in Saf's precious treetop. Come here, Fengi half laughed, as Saf retreated in among the branches, trying not to giggle too much herself. Intruder, get out of my tree, you brute. Damn traitors hiding from the law, Fengi snapped in reply, clearly having just as much fun as Saf, as the two chase each other from branch to branch. Fengi was smaller and faster here, Saf soon finding herself pushed into a corner out on a long lone branch. She considered taking flight once more, looking behind her to check if anything was in the way in case she wanted to jump. When she looked back to Fengi, the young huntress had already launched herself kicking off the tree trunk with wings folded out, just enough to carry her to her intended target. Saf did try to duck out of the way, 
but there was no time as Fengi slammed into her, shoulder checking her right in the stomach. Arms wrapped around Sass' waist as she stumbled over backward, landing on the branch rather hard. Fengi let out an involuntary grunt as she landed on top of the older huntress, not letting go. Got you, Fengi laughed out, scrambling for a better hold on her prey. Ow. Sav let out with a groan, rubbing the back of her head, which had slammed into the branch. Then there was a rather concerning cracking sound. Ah, shit. The two entangled huntresses were suddenly reminded that they were currently about 10 metres off the ground as the branch gave way, sending them tumbling towards the ground. They both instinctively flared their wings to make as much drag as they could, result being it only hurt a lot when they slammed into the flat forest floor below. Fengi clutching Sass waist, all the way down, as the two of them screamed together. Saf had to admit she was a little hazy following the impact, contenting herself with staring at the treetop as broken twigs and leaves rained down around them. That hurt, Fengi let out groggily, head rising up from her rather unfortunate position, looking around and seeming to be just as out of it as Saf somehow. Says you, who was it that just got headbutted in the stomach? Twice, Saf protested, taking a laboured breath, lungs raspy. Then, a pair of feet landed next to the two of them, an unimpressed Esmeralda looking down at the mess, shaking her head. So, what did we learn? Seth sucks at picking branches? Think he's a fat ass? came the replies. No, both of you should take a lesson from calling her on what something can carry. Honestly! Fengi finally moved to get off Saf. Unfortunately, she did so by pushing on Saf's already rather sore belly, eliciting another grunt of pain. Really? Oh, sorry. I did with no. Fengi apologised once she managed to sit up, looking down at the defeated Sapphire. Sure. Just give me a minute. Well, if it helps, I don't think your antics have broken anything, Essie added, as she started to pace around the two huntresses, looking them up and down. Well done. Hey now, training hurts from time to time. I'd like to see you catch me down here, Seth retorted. Essie letting out a long sigh, indicating she probably agreed on that one. Besides, Dakota had been talking about upping training again as soon as they could get away with it. Then again, with the amount of construction work ahead of them, that wasn't seeming too likely outside of those weekends. Only when you do it poorly. You also failed to notice the berries. They were back there. In the forge, Adita and Shiva had set up what Tom could best describe as a sampling. Only instead of wine, they had brought out and organised what looked like every single type of metal they owned. Some in the form of bars, some as scrap, others yet as fine instruments. Tink, Junior, Shiva, Linkosta, and of course Chief Assistant Kieran had been assembled, though Kieran was only there due to the fact he had refused to climb down after Tom had gone to check on Jarek's. As it turned out, Adita mostly just wanted to work out what Tom called them all. And he did have to give her that would be quite useful down the line. What he was interested in, though, was some of the things that he didn't have any clue what they were. So, it's not tungsten? Tom questioned, inspecting the odd dart Adita had produced. According to her, it was supposedly used by an ancient type of arcane firearm one which relied on externally supplied steam pressure to fling the dart at terrifying velocities. Quite why they weren't going with gunpowder or even black powder was beyond him, but one thing at a time for now. Which one was that again? Adita replied, paging through her notes. No, not that one. Assuming we got it right. This is also a magically forged alloy, much like Mithril as you call it. Fair. Well, what can you tell me about this one? It is incredibly hard, yet surprisingly resilient to shattering, hence its use for many types of projectile. Sounds like another miracle metal. Any downsides? Yes. It is very sensitive to heat. Melting point is a mere 500 degrees. That is still a substantial improvement over the lead and mercury is made from. Ah. So, wait, the what now? Tom said, looking up at her before putting the dart back down gently. Maybe gloves for that one. Oh, not to worry, it is quite safe. Until you melt it. They said the same thing about both lead and mercury back in the day. Out of curiosity, what happens when it melts? 
Oh, it splits. But at that point, it is beyond the boiling point of the mercury. Mercury gas. Noted. Let's not try to do that. It will probably be for the best, yes. It is quite useful, though, for any low-temperature applications. When used together with cold steam, it works wonderfully. With what now? Tom questioned. He had heard of superheated steam, all right. But what on earth was cold steam? Cold steam. You know, what you get when you boil... Oh, you wouldn't have that either now, would you? I am very confused, Tom admitted, bracing himself for some laws of physics to get butt-fucked beyond recognition. If it is any help, I don't know what she is on about either, Tinks added, giving Tom a pat on the shoulder, the inventor having taken a seat and watching the artificer intently. Right, so we call it Okraz Zarzith. That means ice water or liquid ice, I think. Lincosta added helpfully, Tom giving her a polite nod before looking back to Adita. Right, Tom replied slowly, as Adita waited to see if he had any questions. It is made from frost powder and water for a rather basic ritual I could teach Lincosta. You know, if you want to. Of course, the young mage responded enthusiastically. Is it much like the rituals upon the blood for inscribing? A bit like that, yes. I do recommend thick gloves, though. It is very cold to work with. Tom didn't even comment, instead just watching and trying to work out what the use of what sounded more or less like supercooled water with extra steps might be. Adita seemingly got the memo, as she noticed Tom staring. Right, yes. The result is a liquid that stays, well, liquid all the way down to negative. 150 degrees by your measurements, she carried on paging through her notes, probably for a conversion chart of some sort. Right. Why? So that it may be boiled at room temperature, of course. So, wait, if this stuff is sitting, it just returns to minus a lot or something then? Oh, no. Once it is made, it cools down to at least minus 100. But if it is then heated from there, it boils into a gas. At room temperature, as much as 40 bar can be achieved. I am sorry, I would need to calculate the exact conversion, but it is approximately that. So it's a cheat code for making high-pressure gas. No need for a pump to put it in there? I'm not sure I know what a cheat code means. Right, sorry. Well, what is it used for then? 40 bar is a heck of a lot. Not sure what a heck is either, but yes, and if the temperature is raised further, even higher pressures can be achieved. The weapon which fires that dart on the table is set to operate at 70 degrees to offset the cooling effect of the gas's expansion. Right. Yeah. When when your hand's frozen off, Tom replied, deep in thought of just what this all meant. He knew the grab oil was all about heat and pressure. It was seen the root of Dragonette Tech had a theme almost, or whoever it might be who had come up with all this stuff. Precisely. The product is often known as cold steam, not many such devices remain since they are all classified as old tech, and thus locked away securely, except for rare occasions. Or hell the Inquisition, I guess, Tom remarked, taking a seat as well and leaning back a bit. Adita looked a touch confused at the comment, glancing to Lincosta before continuing. Yes, of course, but with our mission we should see such weapons restored, but we will be using your technology of boom powder. Right then. I'm guessing we don't need to worry about any steam rifles getting pointed our way, right? Oh, no, Edita replied, smiling with confidence for a second or two, until she broke into a more pondering expression. Well, unless they were found alongside the vessel, Jelena fears they may have uncovered. Marvellous. So we may or may not be seeing Dark Knights boarding some sort of high-caliber armor-piercing rifle, Tom sighed. Try not to sound put down by the notion. At least it sounded like the chance was slim to none. Were they at least single shot? The one firing the dart I brought? Yes. You didn't happen to bring the gun, right? No, I did not have access to one. I have seen one, though. It was quite fascinating. The steam is delivered either from an external line or a backpack due to the raised temperature requirement, though some fully handheld versions operating at room temperature existed. Marvellous. Guessing the rounds for it simply became material stockpile then? Precisely. We cannot melt them down, but if heated up, they forge very well. 
Let's maybe hold off on forging the metal with a tendency to boil into mercury gas for now. At least until we know we need it for something. It would present a fine challenge if you ask me, Shiva added, seeming confident as ever in her abilities to work the fancy metal. Tom had to grant it to her that if anyone could pull it off, it was probably her. But it didn't sound like a risk he would like to run, unless he had to. But should we not get to work? This has gone on long enough. Is it not possible to work and talk at the same time? Yeah, you're right. I guess we did get everything here, more or less. Actually, Adita, what was the Mercury for, if I might ask? Oh, that was for the mold I was given by Acolyte Hannah. She wanted me to bring it for... If I ever manage to incur the wrath of a huntress, she had read they can be vicious and unforgiving creatures. Tom blinked a few times, thinking back to some of his memories of the Keep's huntresses. There was at least some grain of truth in there, but still. Well, what is it then? Why would a huntress want a metal mold anyway? If needed, I could trade you for something, Tinks offered. It makes mercury arrowheads. But that stuff is liquid, Tinks questioned. Rightfully puzzled, Ashiva let out an annoyed grump at work, once more not continuing. Tom was guessing it purely to hold up appearances. She wanted to know this as much as anyone. Not when caught down by means of magic. You fill the mould and insert a shaft, then you hold it with both hands and the arrowhead is caught down by the enchantments until it becomes solid. Once solidified, it is far stronger than even crucible steel. Heavier too. No kidding, Tom let out with a half. He had never thought of using a metal like that before. Didn't sound nice to get hit by at all either. What would even happen as a chunk of mercury started to melt inside you? On second thought, that didn't sound like something he wanted an answer to. I concur, that would make a fine gift. Now can we get to work already? Oleg knows, we have plenty of it. Edita, would you mind sharpening the big saw? We'll be using it plenty, that is assured. Shiva then grumbled even if her tone was not so hard, as was often the case when people were being lazy. Oh, of course. Right away, Master Smith. Well, she sure knows how to play to Sheba's weaknesses, Tom mused to himself, as he watched the approving smile on Sheba's face. One which promptly vanished when she noticed him staring. And what are you looking at? Get to work. You're the one who wanted all this done first thing. Act like it. Yep. Right away. So, who is the god of weather again? Adril sneered, fangs bearing as she trudged along, chains dangling along her sides like wind chimes. Chimes that were letting them know that the wind was in fact picking up right now. It had been raining even before they got up in the morning, though the trees had taken the worst of it before they got waterlogged. It had been going so well yesterday, even if the little training accident had left Sass sore all day, and she could still feel it for that matter. They had gotten the berries, the bark, and even found some tasty mushrooms. Before dinner, all the trees had been either packed up ready for hauling, or sewed up on top of a pair of sacrificial logs to keep them dry, and the people had headed for home. Fengi and Saf had made dinner in the clearing, while a drill turned in early. Saf thought it was more about the dragon not wanting anything to do with them right now. She could understand that after the long walk. She didn't much care for the company of the murderer, either. Dinner had been quite good. They prepared salted venison fried up with the mushrooms and some bread also crisped off in the frying pan. It wasn't like they were lacking in wood, and a cast iron pan was suddenly not a problem to bring when you had a dragon with a harness you could just hang things from. That was yesterday, though. Today had started out with getting a drill hitched up, all while listening to a considerable amount of bitching from said dragon. No matter, though. They had every intention of being home for dinner, if for no other reason than to keep from getting too wet in the rain. Forwarding a few hours and it was pouring down, and they were all completely miserable. Not at all the bit of rain Raulf had promised. Seth couldn't remember the last time the guy had been wrong about the weather. His magic had always been infallible. So infallible, in fact, that she was starting to suspect some foul play was at hand. Her money was on Dakota telling him to underplay it so Seth and Fengi would actually go with a minimal amount of complaining. She would never risk them though, so surely it couldn't be that bad. It would just be a rather shitty day, that was all. If the water kept coming, 
They would soon be walking through a quagmire. Well, they wouldn't be. A drill would, and the dragon was already struggling with the heavy load. Saf was starting to wonder if perhaps the dragon had been boasting about her abilities, or perhaps her weakened condition of constant hills were to blame. The terrain was almost like a washboard once they were clear of the forest. Most of the hills were easily a few dozen meters tall. Fengi and Saf had set up camp on the black dragon's back, using the furs and blankets they had brought to try and keep the rain off and stay warm. It was getting damn cold already though. I said who is the damn weather god? The drill snarled again, after having been ignored for a bit. Kind of depends on who you are asking. For this, I would say Logtech, since we are travelling, Seth replied sarcastically, trusting the dragon's ears to pick her up without a problem. It could also be Mika, if you consider this farming, Fengi added, as thunder cracked in the distance, illuminating the skies above them for a split second. He was so told not to tell us how bad it would get, the bastard, Saf cursed watching as the rain once more turned everything into a grey haze above them. I am blaming Raoul for this. Well, they can all kiss my ass, Adril roared out, as she started climbing the next hill, rear claws digging in deep, as Fengi and Saf felt her put her weight into the harness. It was sturdy work, but even so, that was an awful lot of weight. Saf really didn't want to be around in case a chain snapped. You can take a little break if you want, Fengi shouted out, sounding more than a little concerned. They won't mind if we are a little late, I'm sure. And do what? Sit in the rain? Look around, it's completely open. Where would we go? I don't know. If you find some place, maybe we just stop there for now. It looks like it might get worse. Fine, I'll let you know if the gods give us a cave to hide in. Adril sneered angrily, clearly not convinced by the prospect. Saf was just looking back at the logs concernedly. They had been wrapped up in tarps to try and keep them dry, but surely they were still getting wet right now, meaning all this work would not come to much. Saf didn't know much about wood though, so maybe they could save it? Calling her hadn't sounded that happy about how dry it had been to begin with either, and it took quite something to make that man criticise someone like Celestine. We could really use a fire right now, Saf grumbled, as she felt her fingers starting to go numb while she was holding the pelts and getting wet. And a dry place. Then why don't you two little leeches go find it? The drill roared out, easily enough picking up on what was being said, despite Saf not talking overtly loudly. Because the chances of us finding you again in this weather are next to nothing. I mean, look around, what do we have? 20 meters of visibility, maybe? Something like that, yeah, Fengi echoed. Picking out from under her wolfskin. Next time we will bring more blankets. If we didn't have wings, maybe we could steal one of Tom's jackets. They look nice and warm. Or just go with full travel clothes. I don't think we would need them yet. Yeah, maybe that was quite dumb not bringing those. A coat would be nice right about now. Fucking princesses, I don't have anything. Adriel complained. For once, rightfully so. Seth. Wouldn't be happy if she had to be out here buck-ass nude aside from a harness. But Adril was a dragon. Not like they really had anything to fix that problem with either. Well, maybe short of trying to sew a bunch of skins together to make a sort of makeshift coat. Skins that they had sent to be sold not even a week ago, now Saf came to think of it. At least most of them. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. That isn't looking like just a little rain. Tom grumbled, looking out of one of the window slits of the forge at the increasingly darkening sky. The rain was already falling, so he went to close it up again before he got too wet. It had been raining ever since they got up, and steadily so. Rolf had begrudgingly admitted that maybe it had felt more like a mild storm yesterday, rather than just a constant steady rain, but he had maintained it was nothing to worry about. This morning, though, he shamefully admitted that his estimates might have been off a little bit. Tom didn't know much about how magic weather prediction worked, but if it was anything like meteorologists back home, then he was not comforted by the trend. He had been up early as usual, wanting to get some work done before Jackie rose so they could actually keep up their little workout routine. One look out the window slit though, had more or less convinced him a cheat day would be fine. Right now, Tom was considering going to ask for an update on if it had gotten even worse still. 
He didn't know much about storms around here, aside from how to crash during them, and how hard flying in one was, or the art of hiding indoors with the rest of the dragonettes, which he certainly preferred to being the one designated to go get whatever might have been left outside that day, a fate he was sure would befall him more and more as winter approached. Do you think they'll be alright? he asked, looking into the warm yet dark smithy. The fire of the forge illuminating all the faces either looking at him, or busying themselves with their work. The only exception being the bright white light which Adita's fancy goggles had apparently been able to project. Tom guessed that he just hadn't found the button when fumbling with them. They have been doing such work for years. It isn't rare for hunting parties to get caught by bad weather, even if it is rather cold today, Shiva replied reassuringly. Her stern face lit up further by the springing sparks as she brought her hammer down on the anvil. It's damn cold. I had to go out and take in the washing earlier, much colder than yesterday. It didn't look like something I would try to climb above either, or fly much in for that matter. Wind is getting worse too, Jackie added with a shrug. As she worked the bellows to heat up the forge, Shiva putting the metal stick back in. No, that would be reckless. If they are smart, they will simply hunker down somewhere. They have their shelter walking along with them. The old smith replied, without a hint of worry. I guess a slave dragon really does have his advantages, then. Tom sort of wanted to say something to that, but she was right in the end, and Fengi wasn't here. He just hoped it wouldn't get that much worse. Things have been going so well thus far. Yesterday... Jackie hadn't hurt anyone with the chainsaw, and her ears were still working, so she had probably used the ear defenders for most of it. And they had, in fact, finished all the cutting and trimming in just one day. Glira had returned home with good news. Everything seemed to be in order. The construction crew hadn't been thrilled, but the promise of some rather above standard rate pay soon enough had them on side too. More to the point, they had a mobile saw with them for cutting beams for the keep. It was designed to be packed up and transported by dragon, and they just so happened to be done with it. At least, Glira claimed so. Said Dragon had looked like she was expecting a medal for carrying it all the way first to Dereva, and then back to Bismarty, free of charge, as she put it. And she had brought along one of the workmen from the crew to help them use it. That had of course led to a discussion of how Tom might be able to speed up the device. At the moment, it was powered by a rather intricate system of wheels, pulleys, and rope, that allowed either a large group of people, or more practically a dragon, to use it, by pulling out a length of rope. Tom rather quickly saw a chance to put the quad bike to use. Much as he would find it funny to see Jarex walking up and down all day, the dragon would be useful for other things, and a drill would be hauling for at least a while. That would have to wait for tomorrow though, since he was not going out to start taking measurements in this weather if he didn't have to, even if the thought of snuggling out with Jackie to keep her warm after she inevitably went with him, didn't sound so bad. <laughs>